finished going through uh, the 13 uh, canticles or songs, separate poems of Solomon in the Song of Solomon. But before we uh, pass over this and move on, there, there's some other thoughts. I wanted to go back and kind of review uh, some things from the Song of Solomon and maybe pick up a theme or two uh, and uh, speak on that. And tonight, that's one of the things we want to do, is speak on the subject of love fulfilled. In Song of Solomon, verse one and ver or chapter one and verse four, uh, it says, "We will remember thy love more than wine; uh, the upright love thee." Uh, this was a great love, and the Song of Solomon is the poetic account of a love fulfilled, uh, as told through the eyes of Solomon and the Shulamite maiden who was his bride. And this is a theme and a thought uh, that I believe that uh, speaks to every one of us because each of us, I believe it is kind of the ingrained in us from an early time to desire to find that true love uh, in our lives. And so the Song of Solomon here and the, uh, the love story that it tells uh, becomes an example to us to follow and a challenge to us, I believe too, that uh, we might love one another as uh, we are commanded in the Scripture and as uh, it says of Jesus that, that He loves His church. I want us to notice over there in Ephesians chapter 5, When we speak of true love, and as, as believers, or as those that, you know, you're in church and you hear the, the Word of God being uh, taught, when we talk about love, we need to take it in, its, in a biblical context. And uh, we can't talk about love without going to a couple of other places, passages of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, um, in verse 21, as you go through here, he doesn't just deal with husbands and wives. He goes through the spectrum here of of husband, wife, parents and children, masters and servants, and so on. And as he's speaking to the church and his members together, one of the, of the Lord's churches, uh, he says in verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Uh, we are all to uh, submit or to uh, put the, the needs of others in, in uh, places of scriptures admonish us to, to think of others as more needy than ourselves, to put others' needs above our own. And in that sense, we're submitting ourselves one to another. And as we seek to, uh, to love one another, to serve one another. And beginning with verse 22, he uh, gets specific with that command to submit ourselves one another. Talk about husbands and wives. And he says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For uh, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And, and now this goes back to submitting ourselves one to another in the fear of or that, that, the, the idea there of the, the reverence uh, of uh, holding Him in, in a reverence and, and being in awe of His power and His might and His majesty. God is awesome and we are to be in awe of Him and to hold Him in reverence. And so and as we do that, we submit ourselves one to another. So he's talking about the wives submitting themselves to their husbands as unto the Lord. Because we see here, as he goes through here, the 
relationship between the husband and the wife is compared to that and is set before us as an example of Christ's relationship to His church. Uh, this is His bride. This is His beloved. Uh, that is the uh, other theme in the Song of Solomon is Christ and His, his bride. And so uh, as a church, we're to submit ourselves to the Lord. and He is our head. He is our husband. And, and so on. And so it says here to the wives, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. He said there is a sense in which we as husbands are submitting ourselves to our wives to, to love them and to put their needs uh, up there. And, and to uh, he tells us, you know, you're, you're not your own when we marry. Uh, my life, my body, everything belongs to my wife. And likewise, hers to me. So there's that sense in which we submit ourselves uh, to each other. And so husbands, uh, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, and so on. And so as we read this, and it's describing that uh, husbands are to love the wives, the wives are to love the husbands, as Christ loves His church, as the church submits herself to Him. So when we're talking about love, and the, uh, what we would think is the natural outcome of that is marriage, and the old song, love and marriage, love and marriage goes together like a horse and carriage. You know, marriage should be the obvious result of love uh, in, in between a man and a woman. And so, uh, he describes love here. Uh, how the husband is to love the wife. How the wife is to love her husband. Over in 1 uh, Corinthians, in chapter 13, we see the Apostle Paul and he's admonishing the church at Corinth uh, that there was a lot of problems in the church at Corinth. And one of the underlying problems was they were not exercising love one toward another. If somebody's puffed up in pride, they're loving themselves. They're not loving somebody else. And so when, and we see examples of that through here. There were schisms, there was divisions in the church. Uh, people were puffed up in pride over who baptized them or which gift that they had and all this stuff. And they were failing to have love one toward another. And so Paul defines the characteristics of love. And we talk a lot about love, but here he actually defines for love by its characteristic, how love behaves itself. And this is important for people to stop and think about that. We just think, love, well, you get this feeling, your heart just swells up and all this stuff. But love is manifested by how it behaves itself. So, you know, people talk about, oh, I'm in love. Well, how do you behave yourself toward that person? Oh, so-and-so, they love me. Well, how do they behave themselves towards you? Love is identified by its behavior. And, and so that's what uh, 1 Corinthians 13 points out here. Uh, verse 4 said, charity or love suffereth long. It's long-suffering. First of all, all these people, and we can look around, we can see so many examples, but you hear people, you know, uh, before they get married, oh, I just love this person, I just love them, and they love me, and we just got to get married, and six months later, they're getting a divorce. What happened? Well, this happened, that happened. Well, first thing, quality of love is it's long-suffering. It suffers long. It endures. It is kind. Charity envieth not. 
envy. Envy uh, something else, you know. Uh, you have a, a man and a woman, and there's a lot of things sometimes that, that come up that maybe the man is interested in. And the wife becomes envious of, of those things because the she feels the husband's paying more attention to them to, than to herself. And vice versa. You know, there's things, you know, men and women just look at things differently and have different interests in life. But, you know, we need to recognize that. And, and there is a point that if we love one another, we will want to focus our attention on our spouse. And we need to spend time with our spouse and need to cultivate that time and, and, and those uh, memories together and activities together. But one of the things it mentions here, why is it? Love envieth not. And so, and love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. And that's one of the big problems with the church at Corinth was pride. Pride. You know, and it's one thing when you see examples where, where people are boasting, you know, when we're in high school and, and we play sports or, or whatever, you know, and, and somebody's boasting, well, I could throw the ball further than anybody else on the team, or I could kick the ball further, or I could, you know, make the longest shot playing back, you know, and, and you boast yourself. And, and there's a, this sense of competition, and, and but there shouldn't be a competition between husband and wife. You're not competing with one another, so there's no need to, to boast. That, that's, and that's one of the things about love. Love vaunteth not itself. And that's why when you go back to uh, Ephesians here, when he's talking about husbands and wives, you know, you, you love one another and, and how Christ loved the church and gave himself for it and, and the wife is to submit herself to her own husband and, and all these things as unto the Lord. Uh, they're not seeking their own but the other. And, and that's the idea here. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. But rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. Charity never faileth. And so, see, what happens, we see so many times uh, where people say, well, I, you know, they fall in love. Well, then, well, I just fell out of love. No, he was never in love. Love never faileth. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand what love is. And that's the problem. That's the reason I say, you know, if people just studied the Scriptures and, and formed their understanding and ideas about love from what the Bible says, it'd be a lot different. And so, and, and as we've mentioned, in our culture, it has become the desire and goal of each person to find someone, and, and we should specify the right someone, uh, to fall in love, to get married, have a family, and then live happily ever after. Now that, that's kind of the, the idea we grew up with, wasn't it? You know, as kids, growing up watching Ozzie and Harriet, or Father Knows Best, and leave it, all those good old, old shows that kind of uh, lifted up uh, marriage and the family and things like that, more positive light. Um, we we had that idea. Well, you know, when I get older, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to find somebody and I'm going to fall in love and we're going to get married and we're going to have a family and we're going to live happily ever after, just like they do on TV. Until the season gets canceled or something, but anyway. Uh, What we need to realize is love is not easy either to find 
or to possess. And when I say possess, I mean possessing those qualities, those characteristics that we do, the Bible describes for us as love. It's not easy. We need to realize that our capacity to love is hindered by our sinful natures. And all too often, lust, those fleshly desires, become confused with love. And when this happens, the outcome will not be the happy ever after ending we were expecting. Notice in 1 John 2, Verse 15 and 16. He admonishes, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And, and so uh, when he said, Love not the world, he's specifies here he's talking about the 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 natural fallen corrupted nature of man uh, which he says is the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life don't confuse that with true love it's a big difference James chapter 4 You know, we, we see so many marriages and there's all this fighting and everything. And, and we see it in the churches too sometimes, unfortunately. Because as people have trained themselves to behave and, and they, they behave this way at home, well, it's going to carry over, you know, in, into the church. And, and so James is addressing this, said, from whence come wars and fightings among you? What's, what's the, the, the basis of that? What's the source of that? If there's fightings and there's wars but amongst your members or in a family, he says, where's it coming from? He says, come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. And you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lusts. You see, that's why, you know, uh, when we confuse the, the worldly nature and what passes for love uh, in, in the, the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, Wars and, and fighting is going to be the result. Um, and notice verse 10. This is kind of the key in relationships here. When he says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Now if you want to get over that stuff, if you want to uh, heal those things that that you need to repent and just humble yourself in the eyes of the Lord. In Proverbs 3, Proverbs chapter 3, and, and we quote this often, but it's a, it's a good verse of Scripture, verses 5 and 6. He said, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. And you see how that, in, in what we're talking about here, how that applies. You know, we need to submit ourselves, uh, uh, humble ourselves in the eyes of God. We need to seek His will, trust in the Lord. And don't lean to your own understanding. And that's especially true when it comes to love. 
He said, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Uh, and that includes the ways of the heart. You know, Jeremiah tells us, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so especially in, in the matters of the heart, we need to trust the Lord and let Him direct our paths. Now there's something else, and this kind of goes along with our, our thoughts here. And you've heard this. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. There's a couple of statements here. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, and the other one is beauty is only skin deep. We'll come to that one in a moment. But I, I want us to think about this. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 1 and verse 15, I want us to notice. Solomon says here in verse 15, says of the, the, his beloved, his love, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. See, Solomon says, you know, to me, you're beautiful. That's how, when he saw her, to him, she was beautiful. Now, she looked at herself in the mirror. Uh, this is what she said in verse 6. Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. So, you know, she said, look, I'm, I'm not a beautiful person. I, you know, I've been out in the sun. I'm just working out in the vineyard, and, and I'm sunburned, and my skin's all dried out, and, you know, all these things. Well, see, they, the, the two, they had a completely different image of the same individual. And the point that I want to make from this. You know, she, she saw herself as unlovely. She saw herself as someone that would not attract the, the attention of someone. Yet Solomon fell in love with her. Um, so the lesson here, and this is important, just be yourself. Don't try to impress others. I want you to think about that. Uh, this ties in with the idea of humbling ourselves in the sight of the Lord. Lean not to your own understanding, but acknowledge Him in all thy ways. What you need to do is to seek to be the person God would have you to be. Now I say, just be yourself. If you have a tendency to be a slob, I guarantee you that's not the person the Lord wants you to be. The thing is, make those changes that you feel God is working and laying upon your heart to make you a better person, the person God wants you to be. You do that. But don't try to uh, impress others. And... The things that we do seek to conform our attitudes and our behavior to please God, not man. And we will attract the kind of person then that will be a true mate. Notice Peter's instructions to wives, 1 Peter 3. First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husband. Now, even though it's talking about wives and husbands, if you're not married yet, you can still learn from what he's saying here. There's a good idea, and it goes on and applies it to us guys too. So, likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. That is how you conduct yourself, how you live your life. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. That is, 
you're in the fear of God. You see, you're humbling yourself. And you're seeking to do that which is pleasing to Him. And that's that chaste conversation, the fear of God. Who's adorning? And here's the point. You know, I said, don't try to make yourself attractive or try to attract somebody. Just be the person that God would have you to be. Who's adorning? Let it not be that of the outward adorning of plating the hair and wearing of gold or putting on apparel. You know, that people, women, you know, they dress up, put on the makeup, have their hair done and, and do all these things to make themselves attractive and well, one preacher said one time, <laughs> yeah, my wife's back here, she knows what I'm going to say. I said, well, if the old barn needs painting, paint it. Um, but the idea is, you know, especially young people, where you're, you're trying to attract the attention of someone else. You know. When we're talking about true love, and we're talking about a relationship that's going to last a lifetime, that is not going to work. He said, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And so he's talking about your attitude. Your behavior, as you seek to please God and, and be the person that God would have you to be on the inside. And it's that character, it's that person that is manifested outwardly that will attract the attention of the, the right person. It wasn't the outward appearance of the Shulamite that attracted Solomon. Solomon can surround himself with beauty of all kinds, arts and treasures and precious jewelry and everything. But it was the humble, obedient, working, you know, the, the Shulamite maid and her personality she didn't even know who he was that attracted him to her. And it works for guys too. Uh, he goes on to say here, For after this manner in old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands. So he applies the same thing to them. But even if you're, you're not married, I, I believe, you know, that's kind of what we, we said. You know, that's kind of the goal. That's what we all grow up with. I'm going to grow up. I'm going to fall in love. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have a family. We're going to live happily ever after. Well, if that's your goal, you need to go about the right way. That's God's way. And He's showing you here how to do it. It's, you know, you're not going to attract a, a life mate, a spouse, by making yourself look glamorous on the outside. You'll attract somebody. But it's not going to be a, 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 the spouse that will stay with you for the rest of your life. And guys do kind of, you know, the same thing one way or another. Either, you know, we're, we're wearing shirts cut off so we can show our muscles or, you know, we dress up in a nice suit and clothes look expensive like we've got money because we know women are attracted to money. It, we, you know, we have all these ideas. And so we try to make, we drive the, the nice sports car or the, you know, the, the expensive car or whatever. Why? Because that's going to attract someone you know and so we do the same thing we go about it a little bit differently but guys can do the same thing and the same lesson applies for us 
Seek first to be the kind of person God would have you to be. And one of the things we see here that in doing so, you know, acknowledge Him and all that, and He will direct your paths. Now I tell you, I'll let you in on a little secret. If you hadn't figured it out as we were studying the book of Solomon, Solomon didn't go up to Lebanon looking for a wife. He's going up there on a business trip. He was checking out the vineyards that were uh, leased out. See how they were doing. He didn't go looking for a wife. When God's in it, and when you're submitting yourself to God, and you're seeking His will about a, a spouse, whether you're a guy looking for a wife or a girl looking for a husband, you submit yourself to God's will, and He's preparing you, He's preparing someone for you. Let God choose your spouse for you. I guarantee you He'll do a better job than what you can do yourself. Solomon's path and her path crossed. And he fell in love. And that's something about love. You know, you, you, you don't go looking for love. Love just happens. And it'll happen unexpectedly sometimes. Love uh, can happen. It can be unexpected. And genuine love has nothing to do with the outward appearance and everything to do with inward beauty of character. Proverbs 31, 30. Favor is deceitful. And beauty is vain. What does it mean? Favor is deceitful. Just because a guy or a girl looks good on the outside doesn't mean they're a good person. How many times people have found out that too late and to their hurt? Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord she shall be praised. And again, I think the same thing goes also for the guys. You be the kind of person God would have you to be. Fear the Lord. Um, we see from Peter's observation, this was true in the days of his forefathers in the days of Abraham. And this is a point we want to make. Sometimes people say, well, the Bible, that's old-fashioned, that's out of date. Or, or, you know, when we talk about these things, well, oh, that's just old-fashioned thinking, you know. This is 21st century. This is 2015. Well, the thing is, it was true in the days of Abraham. It was true in the days of Peter. Uh, it's as true today as it was before. Human nature, as we said, doesn't change, and God's Word doesn't change. Um, and when all else fails, God's grace is sufficient. Now, those that are still young and not gotten married yet, you know, these are some good lessons you need to take to heart. For those of us that are older and are married, uh, there's still some uh, things here that uh, we can uh, strive to be better at. Uh, it talks about that we might be conformed to the image of His Son. It talks about our sanctification, and that is a progressive work, and it's not going to end until the Lord calls us home. 
and so we're constantly changing. Uh, one of the things, be patient and allow God to choose your spouse. Uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 4. Psalm, Psalm chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Notice what Psalm says. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes. Um, uh, verse 10 said, How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love than wine. Now, I, I want you to notice here. And do not be afraid to trust God with the desires of your heart. Um, seek to be the person God wants you to be. Serve God faithfully and be among God's people. And He will direct your steps. And the person He has chosen for you and your paths will connect. And one of the things I want us to see here he referred to her as his sister. Sister in the faith, if you will. Um, don't go looking among the lost of this world for the person to marry. Uh, many, many times, people that have been raised in church Look, because we're in this world, we're constantly coming in contact with the people of this world. You know, you go to school, you, your classmates, you go to college, your classmates there, you work somewhere, there's people you work with. Uh, the majority, probably the majority of the time that we spend uh, is with people of the world, in the world. But I tell you, when it comes to seeking a spouse or waiting on God to provide a spouse, you need to be among God's people. In Judges chapter 14, uh, we've, we've talked about Solomon before. Judges chapter 14. Verse 1. And Samson went down to Timnath, and that was a Philistine city. And he saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people, that thou goest uh, to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. And there's the example of the out, looking on the outward appearance of, uh, whatever, and how deceitful the heart can be. She pleaseth me well. But the parents said, how about, you know, uh, of the people, uh, your brethren is talking about those that worship God. The Philistines were heathen. They were unconverted. They were a wicked people. And uh, Solomon says to the Shulamite, my sister. My sister. We need to look among God's people. Samson's marriage did not work out well. Did not end well. And neither will yours if you deliberately disobey God. There will always be exceptions to the rule. You know, we can look around and say, well, so-and-so did this, and theirs worked out good. That may be. But I tell you what, you can't go through life making life choices, breaking the rules, 
and hoping that you will always be the exception. As I said before, when all else fails, uh, when we make bad choices and life doesn't go the way we had hoped, we must cast ourselves upon the mercy of God and trust in His grace. True love is not something that is found. It is something bestowed by God. So the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. When we marry, it becomes our duty, our obligation. And, and, and sometimes duty and obligation are words we don't like to associate with love. But when you marry, when you take a spouse, duty and obligation do apply. And it becomes our duty, our obligation to love our spouse as Christ loves His church. And to submit to our husbands or, and to our wives as the church is to be under subjection, obedience to Christ. And Christ loves His church. When we submit to God and to one another, God will give us the ability to love one another as well. You know, we talk about those God gives and that we grow. We grow in grace. We grow in knowledge. But we can grow in love too. As we said, God's love is never failing. And His mercy and grace triumphs over all. And so these are some thoughts taken from the Song of Solomon and the subject of true love and love fulfilled. I hope they are a blessing and encouragement to us. Let us stand together.